This is the first lecture from chapter 10. This lecture will describe how we determine the shape of molecules. The shape of a molecule is actually really important. Um, I'm sure you've, if you've taken biology, which you probably have, you've learned about active sites and enzymes and um, how certain molecules have to fit precisely into an active site in order to complete a process. So the shape is really important. Um, shape also determines whether or not or how something will react. If it's a very bulky, blocky shape, it's not very reactive. Um, and actually, believe it or not, um, that's how we taste things, the shape of molecules on our tongue and whether or not they fit into certain sites determines how we, um, how we taste them. So what determines the shape of a molecule are all of the valence electrons around the central atom. So whether they be lone pairs or bonding electrons, we know that electrons have a negative charge and therefore they re, um, repel one another. And because of that repulsion, the valence electrons try to get as far away from each other as possible. So basically what we're going to be doing is counting how many electron groups um, areas we have around the central atom and determining the shape they will assume to get as far away from each other as possible. That theory is abbreviated VESPER theory. Um, what that stands for is valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So the first thing you're going to need to do, which is pretty simple, but you um, need to under, understand a couple specifics about it, is you need to count the areas of electron density around a central atom. So a double or a triple bond is one area. Okay, so you don't want to count the, the two bonds and a double bond separately. Um, a lone pair is one area. So again, a bond, whether it's single, double, or triple, counts as one area. So this particular compound has four areas of electron density around it. One, two, three, four. So just to give you a glance of what we're looking at, the basic shapes, it does get more complicated in this, but just the basic shapes. If you have two areas of electron density around a central atom, the farthest they can get away from each other is 180 degrees and assume a linear shape. If you have three areas of electron density, now remember, these areas can be bonds, single, double, or triple bond, or they can be lone pairs. If you have three areas, they will assume a triangular shape, 120 degrees apart from one another, and we call that shape trigonal planar. If there are four areas of electron density, most people might say, Oh, well, they four corners of a square. That is absolutely not correct. If you have four things in three-dimensional space, they will adopt what we call a tetrahedral. It's kind of, imagine a tripod that you put a camera on where you have a stem sticking up and then kind of three legs sticking down. That's kind of the shape of a tetrahedral, and that's how four things can get as far away from each other as possible in space. If you have five areas around the central um, atom, this is where it gets a little funky, you have something we call trigonal bipyramidal. Now, trigonal, because if you look in the plane of the central atom, well, in the, this plane, kind of the X plane, um, we have a tr the trigonal planar shape in there. But then we also have areas going straight up and straight down. And so where that trigonal pyramidal comes from, you don't really need to know this, but if you connect the um, equatorial type positions up to the um, axial positions, you kind of draw a pyramid, like a pyramid that goes up and down. Anyway, that's where the, the name comes from. And if you have six areas of electron density around the central atom, you have a shape we call octahedral, where there are four in a plane, and this is the case where they really do adopt um, four corners of a square. 
but then you also have one going straight up and one going down. We call that an octahedral shape. All the angles are 90 degrees. I forgot to mention in the trigonal bipyramidal, there are actually two. This is by far the most complicated one to deal with. There are two angles. If you're talking about um, the angle between an axial and an equatorial position, that is 90 degrees. If you're talking about the angle between two of the equatorial um, areas, that is 120 degrees. So there are two different angles. So we're going to go through each one, but I just kind of want to give you an overview. Let's start with a simple one. Let's start with ammonia, NH3. And if you draw the Lewis structure of it correctly, now granted that is the very first step of determining a molecular shape is drawing the Lewis structure. And it has got to be correct. You've got to show the lone pairs as well as all the bonds. So if you count the areas of electron density around the nitrogen, which is the central atom, we have one, two, three, four areas. If you go back to the chart we had on the previous page, if you have four areas of electron density, the shape they assume to get as far away from each other as possible is called the tetrahedral. Now notice here that I say electron domain geometry. It gets one step more difficult because even though the electron domain geometry is a tetrahedral, as you can see here, it turns out that if you imagine taking a picture of this molecule, the lone pairs do not show up. So what chemists are interested in are the atoms that are actually bonded to the central atom. So we have these three, they're still forced into a tetrahedral type shape because of this lone pair, but now to get the actual what we call molecular shape, I want you to ignore that lone pair. So they're still bent, they still have the angle of 109.5, but we call this something different. So whereas the electron domain geometry is tetrahedral, the actual molecular shape is called trigonal pyramidal. So this is where it gets more complicated, and you definitely should wait till you're on, at your best, able to pay attention, uh, clear mind. Um, otherwise, you may want to put this on pause and come back to it. Because every electron domain geometry has multiple molecular geometries, depending on how many lone pairs are around the central atom. Let's look at all the possibilities for a tetrahedral electron domain geometry. So if you have an atom with four areas of electron density and no lone pairs, so let's imagine that every area of electron density is due to bonding electrons then it, it remains a tetrahedral molecular shape, okay? And that's the case for all of the shapes. If there are no non-bonding electrons on the central atom, then the electron domain shape equals the molecular shape. In the case of a tetrahedral electron domain geometry, if you have one lone pair, we call this shape, such as ammonia is a good example, trigonal pyramidal. This is flat out memorization, you guys. I've got a chart at the end that you may want to copy or print out. If we have two lone pairs around the central atom that start with a tetrahedral electron domain shape, the shape of the actual molecule is bent. So let's back up and go through all of the electron geometries, starting with only two areas of electron density around a central atom. That's a simple one, okay? Remember, if there are only two areas of electron density, the shape that the molecule assumes to have the electrons as far away from each other as possible is linear. Um, the angle between the electron domains is 180 degrees. Example of that, carbon dioxide. 
<clears throat> if we have three areas of electron density around a central atom, the electron domain shape it adopts is trigonal planar. All of these are in the same plane. The angle is 120 degrees. If there are no lone pairs, such as boron trifluoride here, then the molecular shape is also trigonal planar. If, on the other hand, we have lone pairs, so let's imagine we have um, two areas that are bonding electrons, bonded to atoms, and one lone pair on the central atom. The shape we're dealing with now, the molecular shape we're dealing with now, is bent. Okay. So while both of these have an electron domain geometry of trigonal planar, no lone pairs means the molecular shape is also trigonal planar. One lone pair means the molecular geometry is bent. All right. Now if we have four electron groups, we went over that a moment ago. That is tetrahedral electron domain geometry. As always, if all four regions are bonded atoms, the molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. However, if we have one lone pair, the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. If we have two lone pairs, the molecular geometry is bent. And if we have three lone pairs, we have narrowed it down to a linear geometry. We've chopped off its arms or legs or whatever. Ooh, sounds gross. All righty. All right, I would like you to try this on your own, even if you feel like you're going to be a miserable failure, because I want you to just kind of assess where you're at, where you need your work. So I want you to do your best to predict the geometry of phosphorus trichloride. I even have the steps written out to help you. So the first thing you want to do is draw the Lewis structure. Just kind of a couple hints for that. You count total valence electrons, make single bonds, then give the outer atoms a octet, and then finally put any leftover electrons in the inner atom. All right. Um, after you draw the Lewis structure, you want to count the number of electron groups around the central atom, which is phosphorus, um, and then determine the electron domain shape, and then determine if there are any lone pairs around the central atom, and if so, you may need to adjust your molecular shape. Your molecular shape is then probably different from your electron domain shape. So go back and forth to the... Um, the shapes I just went over if you'd like. And I would put the video on pause and then I'll go over it on the next page. All right, step by step. Phosphorus trichloride has 26 valence electrons. Phosphorus has five and each chlorine has seven. Seven times three is 21 plus five is 26. So if you go through the steps of the Lewis structure, you end up with a Lewis dot structure like this. Count areas of electron density around the phosphorus, which is the central atom. You have one, two, three, four. So its electron domain shape is tetrahedral. However, it has a lone pair of electrons on the central atom. So if you start with a tetrahedral electron domain and you have one lone pair, your molecular shape, that is when you ignore the lone pair, your molecular shape is now trigonal pyramidal. If you got that right, that's amazing. That's really good. If not, don't worry, you will. It takes quite a bit of practice. All right, on to the most complicated one. This one's weird. Um, if you have five electron groups around a central atom, the electron domain shape is trigonal bipyramidal. This is complicated because the equatorial positions, that is the positions in the central plane of the central atom, um, are at angles of 120 degrees from each other. And the 
atoms in the axial position, or the electron areas in the axial position, are only 90 degrees away from its nearest neighbor, the equatorial electron density. So there are, the positions are different in these. Alrighty. So if you have no lone pairs, um, of course, then the molecular geometry is also um, trigonal bipyramidal. Okay, and that would be the case for this example, phosphorus pentachloride. If you have one lone pair in a trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry, look at the shape that's left over from the actual molecule of the atoms. We call that a seesaw. It kind of, if you turned it on its side um, by 90 degrees, it would look like one of those old-fashioned seesaws. Um, and right now, I don't want you to pay attention to the bond angles. We're going to go into that later in this PowerPoint. Um, it is important to know, though, if you have lone pairs of electrons like this compound does, sulfur tetrafluoride, that the lone pairs go into the equatorial position, not the axial position, okay? So you want to put lone pairs in one of these three equatorial positions around the central plane because they can be farther away from each other than if you were to put them up and down on the axial positions. So let's look at all of the trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometries. Again, if there are no lone pairs, the molecular geometry is simply called trigonal bipyramidal. If there's one lone pairs we showed in the last slide, it's called seesaw. And each of these shapes are pretty descriptive. Um, so try to kind of envision where the name came from. That'll help you when you're trying to remember them. If there are two lone pairs, our shape is simply a T-shape. And if there are three lone pairs, we have a linear shape. This one's really odd um, to end up with a linear shape when you have three lone pairs. And just so you can see the individual molecular shapes a little bit more up close, we've already looked at the seesaw up close, but if you look at the T-shape up close, you can see where it gets its name from. And if you look at the linear shape up close, you can obviously see where it gets its name from, too. So normally when you draw the molecular shape, you leave the um, lone pairs out. All right, this is the last electron domain shape. This is the one if there are six areas of electron density around a central atom. We have an octahedral electron domain shape. The nice thing about the octahedral is all the positions are equivalent, all the angles are equivalent. Okay, you now have four that kind of make a square in the central plane, and you have one up and one down, but all angles, regardless of what angles you look at, are 90 degrees in the octahedral. If we have no lone pairs, you guessed right. The molecular geometry is simply octahedral, just like the electron domain geometry. If we have one lone pair, the shape is square pyramidal. This, the name of the shape used to really get me. I'm like, where do they get this from? And again, if you imagine connecting with a line, all of the bonded atoms to this top one, you can make yourself a square pyramid. That's where they get it from. Anyway, that, those type of things help me remember the name. And if you have two lone pairs, now in the octahedral, it doesn't matter where the lone pairs go because all positions are equivalent. However, if you're like me, I'm not, I don't do very well visualizing spatially in 3D. So it helps me to put the lone pairs in these axial positions so that I can see what the shape is. But if you can rotate things in space, you should get the same shape regardless. So what you're left with if you have two lone pairs and you started with an octahedral is square planar. Okay, all four of your bonded atoms make a square in the same plane.
So again, to get kind of a closer look at all of them, uh, the square pyramid shape, again, that's the one um, you can perhaps visualize better. If you connect, you can make yourself a square pyramid. If you have two lone pairs, what's left over are four bonded atoms all in the same plane. So we call that square planar. All right, so now um, there were some funky um, bond angles and a few slides going. I said ignore them for now. But if there's a generic trend that I want you to be aware of. If you have lone pairs, non-bonding pairs on the central atom, I want you to realize that they have a stronger repelling force than bonding electrons. So for example, let's compare these three compounds at the bottom. Methane, which has no non-bonding electrons, ammonia, which has one pair of non-bonding electrons, and water, which has two, if you draw the Lewis structure, two pairs of non-bonding electrons. Now, this bond on methane repels a little bit less strongly than, for example, the lone pair on ammonia. And now water has two of the very strongly repelling groups. Because of the stronger repulsion, if you have long lone pairs, these accepted angles associated with the shapes start getting squeezed smaller. So if you imagine lone pairs as pushing harder, they're making all the bonded angles squeeze in tighter to one another. Now lone pairs need more space, you can kind of think of it like that. And so a kind of a rule of thumb is for every lone pair you have in the central atom, the accepted bond angle for that electron domain shape decreases by two to three degrees. So notice that in the full tetrahedral, uh, CH4 methane without any lone pairs, the bond angles, the prescribed bond angle 109.5 for a tetrahedral. When we introduce one lone pair, that bond angle decreases by two and a half to around 107. And if we have two lone pairs, such as on water, it decreases again to about 104.5. Now, you certainly don't have to memorize these exact angles but it will help you to remember that the bond angles decrease with every lone pair. Um, most of the time, I notice in the ACS final, they'll ask things like, what is the bond angle, let's say, of ammonia? And your choices will be 109.5, less than 109.5, greater than 109.5, and obviously they'll want you to pick, okay, it's less than 109.5 because there's a lone pair. This is not as important as lone pairs, but it is an effect, and um, I don't usually focus on I usually figure I have more important things to focus on, but in case you see it on the ACS final, um, double and triple bonds, because they have more electrons in them than single bonds, also exert a little bit more repelling force than single bonds. And because of that, they push um, other bonds in closer together again. So this particular compound has three areas of electron density. So it would have an electron domain geometer of trigonal planar. Um, and trigonal planar is associated with bond angles of 120 degrees. So notice now that the bond angles closest to the double bond are actually a little bit more than 120 degrees, and the bond angles um, involving the bonds that don't that aren't double bonded have been squished in less than 120 degrees. So that's just a little tidbit you can put in your back pocket. All right, so here's a summary of everything, and this chart to me is invaluable. So you're obviously going to, I never sit and memorize these because I think it's just as important as memorizing it is working that many problems. And so my advice would be print this out or copy this someplace and work enough problems until you have literally automatically memorized all these shapes just by working a lot of problems. 
I think you're wasting your time if all you do memorize without doing problems. All right, so quick summary on how to read this. The number of electron groups, okay, or the electron geometry always come first. And then depending on the lone pairs, you have a certain molecular geometry, okay? So if you have zero lone pairs, obviously the molecular geometry is going to match the electron geometry. There are two pages to this chart. This is takes you up through four electron groups. The next page takes you to the more complicated five uh, electron domains and six electron domains. Here is a challenging one for you. This is one of my favorite shapes. Hint, hint. Okay. Notice there's a negative charge there, and I hope that you remember what to do with that in your Lewis dot structure. And again, I would like you to turn off the video and go through this yourself, even if you aren't feel really incompetent to do so. Give it a shot, okay? And then I will go over it step by step on the next slide. So remember, before you start drawing the lowest structure, to count the total number of electrons in that monster. All right, so here's the answer. I'm hoping you tried it on your own first. ICL4 with a minus charge has 36 valence electrons, so iodine has seven. There are four chlorines, and each one has seven valence electrons, and then there's one extra due to the negative charge. And so that gives us a total of 36 valence electrons. So you end up with four chlorines bonded to the iodine, and then you have two lone pairs on the central iodine. It's very odd. This is why you need to practice so you don't think this is impossible. It's actually not. Iodine is a pretty large atom. It can expand its octet, and it often does. So how many areas do you have around that central atom? Well, you have the four chlorine bond plus two lone pairs. So you have a total of six areas of electron density. That means that your electron density shape is octahedral. Okay, that would probably get you half credit getting that much. Now, before you determine molecular geometry, you have to take into account the two lone pairs. First, you need to know how to draw an octahedral shape. And so you would put four chlorines. I always put the bonded atoms in the equatorial, although it doesn't matter for the octahedral shape, but just for envisioning it, it helps me. And I put the lone pairs axially up and down. Once you have done that, now you have to try to ignore those lone pairs and see what are you left with, okay? Here, what you're left with is the square planar molecular geometry. If by some freak chance you got that right, I am incredibly proud of you. That's a tough one. If not, please go to the problem solving folder and start working problems. Okay, in real life, we have molecules that are not quite as simple as the ones we've been working with. We have molecules that have multiple central atoms. For example, look at this one. Um, we have, we could look at this segment of it, which kind of looks like ammonia, right? And then we have another segment right in the middle, another one, and another one. What the heck do we do? What do we call the central atom? In this case, you have to look at each central atom, each atom that's along the backbone. Okay, so I'm going to call that the backbone. And determine the shape at each of these central atoms. So let's look at this. You would have to, again, um, be able to draw the little structures. Um, and that sometimes that's easy to do when the molecule's drawn out for you. You just want to make sure everything has an octet. So notice that I quickly knew that nitrogen has a lone pair because it only has six elect valence electrons around it. Two, four, six. And I knew it won eight. 
And plus, I'm just used to seeing nitrogen. I almost always have a lump here. Carbon already has eight electrons around it. Okay, two, four, six, eight. So I left it alone. Oh, whoops. So the shape with respect to nitrogen is trigonal pyramidal. The shape with respect to carbon is tetrahedral. This carbon has one, two, three electron domains, um, but it does have an octet because one of the bonds is a double bond. So it does have eight electrons around it, but because it only has three domains, it has a trigonal planar shape. And here's oxygen. Again, oxygen really frequently has two lone pairs. Just kind of a little way to help you without having to go through the rigorous Lewis dot structures. So in order for oxygen to have an octet, it needs these two lone pairs here. So its molecular shape, although its electron domain shape is tetrahedral, its molecular shape is bent. You won't get as many of these, but you will get at least one. So I wanted you to be familiar with it. And the final note that I'll say to you is chemists have rather unique ways of drawing molecules so that they look 3D on paper. So let's say that I had methane, CH4. And if you remember, since that has four areas of electron density around the central carbon, that is a tetrahedral shape. How do you draw a tetrahedral? Okay, you certainly don't draw it like I see a lot of students do. They're like, oh, okay, I'm just, that's a square planar shape. That is completely, totally wrong. Do you remember me saying that a tetrahedral shape is kind of like a tripod that you put your camera on, where you have one area going straight up, and then the other three are kind of like um, the tripod legs, okay? So this is really, if you, if you did this, you would definitely get more credit than doing that square planar thing. At least you're kind of trying. But what chemists do is they use wedges and dotted lines. And if you see a wedge, which it's a solid wedge, so it's all filled in, kind of like a triangle, that means that whatever is attached to that is coming out at you. If you see a dotted line, that means that whatever is attached to that is going into the paper. So here's the best way to draw methane, um, and it shows the tetrahedral shape. A lot of times in order to do this, you actually need a model in front of you, but um, for tetrahedral shape, two of the areas are in the plane of the paper. One goes back into the paper and one sticks out at you. Here's what a molecular model kit would look like, which you'll, you'll use those pretty heavily in organic chemistry. But that's it for molecular shapes. And the next lecture will be determining the polarity of the overall molecule once we can figure out the shape.